Welcome everyone. Today we're getting back to basics and answering fundamental questions like, what is a computer? A deceptively simple question, it's true, but whether you already know the answer or not, I hope this video can help you learn a thing or two about how the parts for a computer, and more specifically a computer built for PC gaming, fit together, and what each component's job is. Welcome everyone to the return of my How to Build a Computer series, starting from scratch with a tutorial designed for beginners and experienced builders alike. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by Micro Center. This is one of my favorite places to buy PC parts. So if you're building or upgrading your PC, I highly recommend making your way down to one of their 25 retail stores in the US. They have consistently competitive prices and an excellent selection of PC hardware and other tech goodies. And they have a custom PC builder on the Micro Center website. Use it to spec out your rig and it will show you parts in store at your nearest location while ensuring compatibility. Then you can pick up in store or have their pros assemble it for you. So click the sponsor link in the description to find a Micro Center near you. So this is part one of my new How to Build a PC series, and I will be following up with a couple build guides for a budget and a high-end system, as well as a setup tutorial for getting your assembled PC ready for actual gaming, streaming, or whatever else you want to do with it. Also, keep in mind that a full PC gaming setup would include a few other things beyond the desktop system itself. You will need a monitor, peripherals like a keyboard and mouse, an internet connection, which I'm assuming you already have since you're watching this internet-based video. A monitor and peripherals are some of the easiest parts to carry over from an old system, so consider that option if you're on a budget. But for the rest of the video, I'll be focusing on the core hardware components of the desktop system. And a desktop PC is made from seven parts. Number one, a processor or CPU, AKA central processing unit, which will often come with a stock heatsink fan for cooling. Second is the motherboard, which everything plugs into. Third is memory or RAM, random access memory that holds onto data that the computer needs very quickly, but only while the computer is on. The fourth part is storage, the kind that stores data even if the PC is turned off. And for that, you'll need at least one storage drive, typically an SSD or solid state drive. Number five is a power supply to supply power, which is often abbreviated as PSU for power supply unit. Sixth is a case, AKA a chassis to hold everything together, protect the parts inside, and the case will usually come equipped with some system fans to provide some airflow as well. And seventh, if you want your PC to be a gaming PC, is almost always going to be a dedicated graphics card or GPU graphics processing unit. So if you can fill out your shopping list with compatible versions of these seven components, you should be able to assemble a functional gaming PC. But note that there are always add-ons available. Some CPUs do not come with a heatsink fan, for example. So that might be an eighth item you need to add, or you might just want to upgrade from the stock unit for better cooling, quieter operation, or maybe something that looks a little bit nicer. Cases typically come with one to three fans installed for airflow, but you can usually add more, or again, upgrade to better ones or fans equipped with aesthetic features like RGB lights. Everyone can use more storage via additional SSDs or hard drives, or more memory for that matter, but the upgrade path is a slippery slope. But if you build your own system, it will give you the confidence to add things on down the line if you need them. But for now, let's get started with this basic seven part list. So part number one in more detail this time is the CPU, the processor, which I like to think of as the beating heart of the computer. Processors do math. Simply put, although that is an oversimplification, but whether you're punching a basic math problem into the calculator app, or you're playing a game and the game engine needs to calculate whether or not that sniper shot you just took will intersect with your opponent's head, the faster your CPU can calculate, generally speaking, the better. The CPU, along with the GPU, will usually be one of the most expensive components in your PC, but also one that most impacts overall system performance. There are a few things that impact a CPU's performance, starting with the fundamental chip design or architecture. Again, to simplify, the most recent architecture is typically the fastest. Intel's CPUs that launched in 2022, based on their 13th generation architecture, are faster and more efficient than Intel's 12th generation CPUs that launched in 2021, all else being equal. The next specs to consider are core count and frequency. For core count, imagine you have a bunch of math problems that need doing, all lined up in a queue, and you have one calculator to do them on. That's one core. Now imagine you add another calculator, 
another core, then you can do twice as many math problems at once. They've been adding cores for a while now, so in 2023, a reasonably respectable gaming PC will probably be a six core or an eight core, although mainstream options go all the way up to 16 core, and then they will often do a thing called multi-threading, where each core gets two queues of math problems to do, which is why you'll often see six core 12 thread or 16 core 32 thread listed in a CPU specs. Okay, so if you know each core has a long line of math problems to do, we'll call that a thread. With multi-threading, each core gets two threads and each core can do a math problem from each of its threads once every clock cycle. And that is what a CPU's frequency is. That clock cycle frequency can increase and decrease dynamically every second. And for current gen CPUs, it can be pretty fast, typically in the four to six gigahertz range. And one gigahertz is one billion times per second. It's a pretty fast heartbeat. Pushing a CPU to run at an even higher frequency than it's spec'd for is called overclocking. And that's a bit beyond today's video, but it helps to know what it is. It's also helpful to know that Intel specifically has been differentiating the cores in their most recent 12th and 13th gen CPUs. They have performance cores or P cores and efficient cores or E cores that run at lower frequencies, but are also more efficient, hence the name. They've achieved some good success with this method, but it does make reading their CPU specs just a little bit more confusing. So with an understanding of these fundamental CPU specs, let's take a look at a few listings online from the two current manufacturers of CPUs for mainstream PC gaming, which is AMD and Intel, two brands that you might have heard of. Intel is historically the larger of the two, but AMD has been on quite the comeback run over the past five years or so, and the good news is that they both have excellent CPUs for PC gaming, from the budget range all the way up to the high end. So taking a quick glance at Newegg's processors desktops category, and we can see both AMD and Intel options listed here. And the final spec you should keep an eye on is gonna be socket compatibility, and that's a spec you'll need to match up with the motherboard that you choose. More on that in a minute when we go over motherboards. For now, here's a listing for Intel's current flagship, the Core i9 13900K. So other than the price, right here at the top, we can see several of the key specs that we were talking about. How many cores does it have? 24, and as mentioned with the recent generation, we have P cores and E cores. The P cores do have hyper threading, so this CPU, even though it has 24 cores, still has 32 threads, just like AMD's current flagship, the Ryzen 9 7950X, which has 16 cores and 32 threads. And you will also quite typically see the frequency listed alongside that as well. But do note that there's often an operating frequency as well as a turbo frequency, where the CPU can sort of overclock itself situationally as long as it's not too hot. Speaking of heat, you will also often see a power rating like 170 watts for the 7950X, and this can often be used to determine what sort of aftermarket cooler you want to get if you're going with aftermarket cooling. Here's another example of a current gen AMD CPU, the 7600X. This one is a six core, which is gonna have 12 threads. And then again, you have the frequency right at the top as well as the socket compatibility. In terms of price ranges right now, both AMD and Intel have viable options that are six core in the 150 to $200 range, and the peak pricing will go up to 600 to $700. But that's not quite all for item number one, the CPU. There's also the CPU cooler which for budget builds and beginners will often come packaged with the CPU, also known as a stock heatsink fan, which is totally fine and adequate for getting started. These are pretty simple to install. I will be going over that in the build tutorial video and they do an adequate job of cooling. Just make sure that your CPU actually does come with a stock heatsink fan if you're parting out your own build and you plan to use it. It's actually the higher end CPUs that often don't come with a stock cooler. The ones that are unlocked for overclocking, usually ending with an X for AMD like the 7900X or K for Intel like the 13900K because they figure if you're going for that kind of CPU, you'd probably want a better cooler anyway. But again, it should be listed on the product page whether the CPU does come with a stock heatsink fan as well as what kind it is or crucially, if it does not. For those who want a cooler or quieter CPU though, there's an eighth item on the parts list and that's an aftermarket cooler. And a sensible air cooler for just about any mainstream CPU should run you about 30 to $60, although they do range up to about a hundred bucks or so. And then there are also all-in-one liquid coolers or AIOs, which do cool better and are almost required for the highest end CPUs currently, but an AIO will cost you anywhere from $80 to 200 plus for the fancier ones with 
larger radiators, more fans, and even RGB lights and LCD screens, which this one does ship with, but it's not mounted right now. And again, RGB lights and LCD screens do nothing to increase your PC's performance. I said sensible when I mentioned those air cooler options because I do think that's the sensible choice. And as a bonus, they don't have a fluid pump that can fail and cause your CPU to overheat and your PC to shut down while attempting to restart, corrupting your operating system and generally causing a shit show. Not that that has ever happened to me. Part number two is the graphics card, AKA video card, AKA GPU or graphics processing unit. Although technically the GPU is the chip at the center of the graphics card, kind of like a CPU nestled in its own little motherboard, but the term GPU is often used interchangeably to refer to the chip itself or the whole card. As I mentioned with CPUs, the GPU will usually be one of the most expensive components in your PC. It is often more expensive than the CPU in many builds. And again, it is the other part that most impacts performance. The GPU's capabilities affect gaming performance primarily, although some other kinds of software can leverage your GPU you for performance gains as well. Gaming performance is typically measured by the frame rate a gaming PC can output, or frames per second, FPS, and it is impacted by a lot of variables from the entire PC's hardware configuration to the game engine software itself. Moving to a higher resolution monitor is another example. Like if you go from a 1920 by 1080 resolution monitor to 2560 by 1440, or all the way up to 3840 by 2160, also known as 4K, which would require a more powerful graphics card to achieve the same frame rates. And since gaming monitors have not only increased their resolution lately, but also their refresh rates, from the standard of 60 hertz to 120 or 144 hertz, all the way up to 240 hertz and beyond, you'll want a GPU that can output a similar frame rate or better in order to achieve that silky smooth PC gaming experience. Video card specs can be confusing because they are kind of like mini PCs themselves. The GPU has a core count, kind of like CPUs do, but it's thousands or even tens of thousands of cores for GPUs, and they shouldn't really be compared directly to CPU cores or even between different GPU brands or even different generations of GPUs from the same brands. The current gaming GPU manufacturers are NVIDIA, AMD, and most recently Intel, by the way, but for the GPU cores, NVIDIA calls theirs CUDA cores, AMD goes with stream processors, and Intel calls them XE cores. My point is the GPU specs go on and on. Those CUDA cores are grouped into streaming multiprocessors. There are also graphics and texture processing units, Tensor and RT cores. It boggles the mind and that's just an NVIDIA GPU. So how should a new PC builder decipher all this information? Let's boil it down to two items. First, the GPU name itself, which is going to be part of a family or series of cards, which can be used to determine how recently a GPU launched. NVIDIA's gaming GPUs are called GeForce, and the most recent families are the 30 series, which launched back in 2020, including cards like the RTX 3080 and RTX 3090. Their more recent 40 series debuted in late 2022, such as the RTX 4090 and RTX 4070 Ti. But those are all quite expensive for now, so there's some overlap with the last generation 30 series for budget and lower end cards with the NVIDIA product stack. AMD's gaming GPUs are called Radeon, and their previous generation 6000 series cards like the Radeon RX 6900 XT launched in 2020, and the follow-up 7000 series also launched in 2022, and like NVIDIA, the more recent cards are still in the $800 to $1000 range. Meanwhile, Intel's gaming GPUs are called Arc, and they're currently on the 700 series that also launched in 2022. Even though Intel has been making CPUs for a very long time, the Arc series of GPUs are fairly new to the company. So you can use the GPU name to check review videos and articles to see the general level of performance you should expect from a given video card or GPU. Although again, remember that there are lots of variables in testing methods, hardware, game settings, as well as multiple retail versions of each given video card. So it helps to check multiple sources and keep an eye out for reviews that test specific games that you want to play. Secondly, once you have a good idea of what GPU you want based on the price and performance expectations, take a look at the individual cards that are out there based on that GPU to see what the price range is and what the feature options are. Most GPUs have a fixed memory setup, such as all Radeon RX 6700 XTs will have 12 gigabytes of video memory, but some GPUs have versions with more or less memory, like Nvidia has an RTX 3060 with eight gigabytes or 12 gigabytes of memory, and typically more is better, but in this case, the 12 gigabyte version also performs better due to other changes Nvidia made under the hood. Also note that the brands that manufacture complete graphics cards using AMD, Nvidia, or Intel GPUs 
are also more various. You can get an RTX 4090 made by Asus or MSI or Gigabyte or Zotac, and they all might have slight differences in the cooler design and features like RGB, but they should all perform typically within about two to 5% of each other since they're working with the same GPU and memory setup otherwise. Here, the differences between different cards that use the same GPU underneath is where pricing and small details might affect your decision. So check my monthly build series for my regular suggestions on the best value parts for your money. The good news is that compatibility with the rest of your PC parts shouldn't be too much trouble with a GPU. I won't be covering pricing today since that ranges from about $200 to $2,000 plus for a reasonable discrete GPU, but all the cards should be using the PCI Express interface, and all mainstream motherboards should have at least one primary top slot that is PCIe 4.0 or PCIe 5.0 with a by 16 connection that's compatible to drop your card into. Beyond that, make sure your power supply is up to snuff and all GPUs should have a recommended PSU wattage suggestion for you, which is typically in the 500 to 750 watt range. And it's not a horrible idea to go 50 or 100 watts over that, depending on how many extra components you're planning to add to your system. Also, make sure your case has enough clearance for your chosen card, both in terms of the length as well as the depth, especially with some of the more recent cards that have launched, which are absolutely massive. Okay, we've spent a lot of time on the CPU and the GPU, but we were getting some fundamentals worked out too, so the rest of the parts should be a bit faster. Part number three is the motherboard. The motherboard is the part of your PC that ties everything together, kind of like a nice rug. So let's go over the four key elements of a motherboard that you should keep in mind. There is the CPU socket, of course. That is that thing that's usually towards the center of the motherboard that your CPU plugs into. Make sure that your socket matches your chosen CPU. AMD was using this AM4 platform for quite some time, specifically with socket PGA1331, and this platform is still very viable today and is a great way to get by on a budget. That's why we are using this platform for the upcoming budget build tutorial. AMD launched their next-gen AM5 platform at the end of 2022, though. That uses socket LGA1718 right now, which has the cover on it because those pins can be delicate, and I have a video on LGA versus PGA socket if you're interested in the differences between the two. But that is what you need for their newest CPUs, such as the 7700X all the way up to the 7950X3D. For AMD, the platform terms of AM4 or AM5 are used more often than the actual socket. But on the Intel side, you typically get two generations of CPUs per platform, and the current platform uses socket LGA1700 for Intel's 12th gen and 13th gen CPUs launched in 2021 and 2022, respectively. Intel's prior platform, LGA1200, was for their 10th and 11th gen CPUs from 2020 and 2021. Again, platforms that are two to three years old are still very viable, but they grow steadily harder to find on retail sites as they age, and also they don't have as many options for upgrading in the future. Next is the form factor, also known as the size of the motherboard. The typical size is ATX. That's the most common, like this one, and this one, and this one. That's where you'll find the most options available, and it will give your system the most flexibility and room to grow. If you get an ATX-sized motherboard, you should also get a case that supports ATX motherboards, and you should be good to go. There's also mini ITX, tiny boards meant for compact small form factor builds. These are very cute, but they can be a challenge for new builders due to odd layouts and tight spaces for cable management. There's also the middle child micro ATX, which I like because it's in between ATX and mini ITX, but you won't find as many cases or motherboard options in that size. The last two motherboard features you want to consider are the chipset and then extra features and slots. And here I'm going to direct you to my motherboard specific video, which is picking out a motherboard with three levels of skill. And then I also have a video on the chipset differences for the new AM5 platform because AMD came out with four different chipsets that all have slightly different different feature sets. To sum up though, the chipset is an extra chip that's on the motherboard. Usually it has a cooler on it and usually it's right down in this area. And the chipset you go with might determine connectivity features like how many SATA ports or how many extra PCI Express ports the motherboard has, or whether or not the motherboard is fully unlocked for CPU overclocking. AMD has a lot of their CPUs unlocked for overclocking and likewise a lot of their motherboards unlocked for overclocking. AMD has mainstream chipsets that start with B, like B650 on the AM5 platform or B550 on on the AM4 platform. Those aren't quite as feature rich as the X series options like X670 or X570. But the good news is both the B series and the X series chipsets from AMD will allow you to overclock an overclockable CPU. 
Meanwhile, on the Intel side, the highest end chipset starts with Z, like Z590 for their prior generation LGA 1200 motherboards. And it's only the Z series chipsets from Intel that will allow you to fully overclock and unlock for overclocking CPU that ends with K, like the 13900K. And for their current generation LGA 1700 platform, the Z series is Z690 and Z790 for the chipsets. Beyond those core chipset features, there's a lot of stuff that manufacturers can try to throw at a motherboard in order to make it seem more feature rich or more capable than other motherboards. But again, a lot of those extra features, RGB lights, LCD screens, crazy overclocking features meant for professional overclockers that typical users will probably never actually use, can often significantly increase a motherboard's price and here along with GPUs motherboards can get really expensive and I've seen way more motherboards that cost five hundred to a thousand dollars in the past couple years than prior to that but again if you're trying to stick to a budget AMD's AM4 platform you can still find motherboards that are 130 to 150 dollars to do everything you need them to do and even with the new platforms AM5 and LGA 1700 you can find boards that are 200 to 300 dollars you don't necessarily need to spend 500 bucks plus Moving on to part number four, we have memory system RAM, which is called volatile memory because while it is very fast, it also only works while the system is powered on, which is why you also need permanent storage too. Memory comes in sticks or DIMMs, dual inline memory modules, and you will probably start out with a two stick kit so you can set up a dual channel configuration. A starter build will probably go with a 16 gigabyte configuration for right now, and 32 gigabytes is a good amount to aim for, meaning you'll want a two by eight gigabyte kit for a 16 gig setup, or two by 16 gigabytes for 32 gigs. Now there are two memory standards in the wild at present, DDR4, which is used on the slightly older AMD AM4 platform, and Intel's LGA 1200 motherboards, and the newer and a bit more pricey DDR5, which kicked off in 2022. DDR5 memory is required required for AMD's newest AM5 platform, and for Intel LGA 1700, you actually have the option to use either, but you make that choice when you pick your motherboard. So get a DDR4 LGA 1700 board if you want less expensive but slightly slower memory, and DDR5 if you want the newest and fastest and you have the money to spend. Apart from the capacity and the version, memory also has a speed measured in mega transfers per second, and also what are known as timings, detailed settings that basically affect how long memory waits before it performs a given function. A good kit of DDR4 memory will likely run at 3200 to 3600 mega transfers per second, and newer DDR5 can get up to 6000 speed or even beyond that, particularly with Intel's latest CPUs, which are pretty good at running high speed memory. Memory is yet another whole world of spec minutia and further details under the hood, but for beginners, you'll probably just use the built-in settings to get up and running. Those are called XMP or Extreme Memory Profile Settings settings and Intel standard that can still work with AMD platforms, that's what AM4 still uses, but for the new AM5 platform there are now kits with Expo settings designed specifically for AMD CPUs, so I'd recommend an Expo enabled DDR5 kit like this Flare X5 kit from G-Skill if you're building on AMD's latest platform. Storage is the last part of your build that can directly affect system performance, although it will mostly be load times for your operating system or games. There are a few storage standards out there to familiarize yourself with though for now. The oldest kind of storage drive that's still regularly used is a mechanical hard drive, HDD. And these are called mechanical because they're moving parts inside, spinning disks as well as a read-write arm that moves out over them to read or write data. Mechanical hard drives are still the capacity king for now. It's really hard to get equivalent capacity in solid state drives that you can get with mechanical drives. And there are now drives that go up to 20, 30 terabytes or more, although those are often designed for data center use. So consider a mechanical hard drive if you have lots of data to back up, but lots of gaming PCs these days can get by using only solid state drives. Solid state drives use NAND flash memory, so they can store data with no moving parts, and as a result, they're much more responsive. And you can also get much faster faster read and write speeds. The original standard for solid state drives carried over a lot of connectivity from hard drives, so they still use a SATA interface, and they're available in 2.5 inch models like this, which is the same size that they used to make mechanical hard drives in for laptop use. 2.5 inch SATA SSDs are a great way to get more capacity for your dollar, and these can be regularly found in one to two terabyte or even four terabyte capacity.
capacities, but due to using the SATA interface, they're gonna max out at about 550 megabytes per second read and write speeds. And if you wanna go beyond that, you need to step up to the current standard for solid state storage, which is M.2 drives. Again, there are a lot of details on M.2 drives that I'm not gonna dive into today, so I will reference my video on M.2 SSD storage down in the description. But other than capacities, and you'll probably start off with about a 500 gig M.2 SSD drive at bare minimum and possibly upgrade to one terabyte, two terabyte, or even four terabyte drives are becoming more common now. You should bear in mind that you need an M.2 slot to install this to on your motherboard. Most current motherboards are gonna have at least one M.2 slot, if not two, three, or even four. And then you should also check the M.2 drives PCIe standard. There are PCIe 3.0 drives, PCIe 4.0 drives, and now even PCIe 5.0 drives. And the PCIe version just gives more bandwidth available to the M.2 drive itself. So again, the bang for your buck drives right now, which is gonna be about a one one terabyte M.2 SSD for around $50 to $60, or a two terabyte drive for around $90 to $110, will probably be those PCIe 3.0 drives that still achieve 1,500 to 2,000 megabytes per second read and writes, which is about two to four times as fast as SATA drives are capable of. And then of course you can pay more money from there to get PCIe 4.0 or PCIe 5.0 drives that get up to crazy read and write speeds of 4,000, 5,000 megabytes per second plus, which is impressive, but again, for a gaming PC, isn't really going to affect your performance all that much. Next is the case, which I've sort of already talked about the key point for in the motherboard section, apart from keeping your parts safe from cats and small children, a case should primarily be sized appropriately with your motherboard, ATX motherboard, go for ATX case. And then the second most important feature for a case is going to be its airflow. For quite a while, a lot of cases were built with solid front panels that were kind of restricting airflow to go for a nicer looking case. Aesthetics are nice in terms of PC building, but performance should always be first on the list. So grabbing a case with a mesh front panel like this Fractal Focus 2 is a good call. And here again, I would reference independent reviews on the specific case you might be looking at to determine if it has good performance in terms of airflow. And then from there, you can look at other features, like does it have a tempered glass side panel to give you a nice look at the interior components? Does it have good front panel I.O., like having a USB Type-C connector there is very convenient to have, especially if you plug in a USB Type-C device to the front of your computer a lot. Beyond the motherboard size matching up, you should also reference the length and again, width of your graphics card to make sure that will fit in comfortably. Likewise, if you're going with a tower style air cooler, those can get pretty tall, so make sure the maximum cooler height is something that you've checked as well. Beyond all that, cases are again something that can scale up in price pretty significantly. Not quite as bad as like motherboards and graphics cards, but I find that there are plenty of options in the $70 to $100 range that meet most people's needs for a gaming PC. And then there are some really nice cases in the $100 to $200 range that give you more extras like additional tempered glass side panels, more pre-installed high quality fans, better build quality overall, and more intuitive of layouts that assist with the building process. And lastly, for my basic seven part list and a video that's getting pretty long at this point, you will need a power supply for your computer too. And here, the typical standard is ATX sized with a smaller SFX size also available for small form factor builds. Some higher wattage power supplies can also get a bit longer this way, so that might be something to consider, but again, probably only if you're looking at a model that's 1200 to 1600 watts. An ATX sized PSU should fit into an ATX case, and then you just need to figure out the wattage you need and some extras. For wattage, as I already mentioned, you should reference the graphics card that you're planning to use, or if you're starting off with a budget graphics card, but maybe you wanna upgrade in the future, look at the wattage requirement for that card that you aspire to. And that's probably gonna to top out at about 750 watts right now. It's only gonna go beyond that if you're going with the Nvidia cards that cost 1200 to $2,000. So your wattage is probably gonna be in the 650 to 850 watt range. Don't go for a power supply just cause it says 1200 watts or something like that. There are inexpensive but poorly made power supplies that I would typically recommend you avoid. Stick to power supply brands that are a little bit more reputable and well-known. Cooler Master, Corsair, EVGA, Silverstone, Thermaltake are a few just off the top of my head. There is an efficiency standard called 80 plus that you might wanna keep an eye on. 80 plus bronze is sort of your basic level and then you can go to 80 plus gold or even 80 plus platinum. That standard is not rigidly enforced so it is not the end all in terms of determining the quality of the uh, parts that are used to build the power supply. But I do still recommend going for 80 plus bronze at minimum. And then for power supply extras, apart from RGB and silly stuff like that, the main thing is gonna be the cables themselves and whether it's modular, non-modular or partially modular. Fortunately, most power supply manufacturers have realized that PC builders do not want 
brightly colored garish power supply cables. So most that you'll find these days are all black and I do like this flat ribbon style. It's great for cable management. And then again, a modular power supply is nice to have because it lets you only plug in the cables that you need. Again, great for cable management. And you might find partially modular power supplies that have fixed cables for the ones that you know you're gonna need like your main 24 pin power connector for the motherboard, but then have modular plugs elsewise. And I wanna say that that is it, but really it's not because while I've hopefully done a fairly reasonable job of giving you a high level overview of the core components that you need to get together to build a gaming PC, there are always extras you can add, upgrades to fans, RGB LEDs, all-in-one liquid cooling, additional peripherals that you can add like VR headsets, gaming sticks, gaming controllers. There's the whole world of exotic PC cooling where you get into custom water cooling setup and beyond like liquid nitrogen, but that is way beyond the scope of today's video. So once again, if you guys have made it through this entire video, I hope you have learned a thing or two about the components that go into a PC and you've gotten a better idea of how to tackle the project yourself if you're getting into building a gaming PC for the first time. If you are getting into PC building for the first time, then I highly recommend subscribing to my channel because I have two tutorial videos plus a setup video coming at you very soon where I will guide you through the building and setup process step by step for a budget system as well as a high-end build that includes all that crazy stuff like wiring up RGB fans. Apart from subscribing, I would really appreciate it though if you hit the thumbs up button on this video if you enjoyed it and if you learned something from it, of course. And you can check out my store at paulshardware.net where you can buy shirts, mugs, pint glasses, beer sets, and more. And that's a great way to help support my channel while getting yourself some awesome merchandise at the same time. Once again, stay tuned for those follow-up tutorial videos coming at you real soon. Thanks again for watching this one and we'll see you in the next video.